Chapter Two of The Black Dwarf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Tom Bragg. The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter Two. Will none but Hearn the Hunter serve your turn? Merry Wives of Windsor. In one of the most remote districts of the south of Scotland, where an ideal line drawn along the tops of lofty and bleak mountains separates that land from her sister kingdom, a young man called Halbert or Hobby Elliot, a substantial farmer, who boasted his descent from old Martin Elliot of the Preakin Tower, noted in border story and song, was on his return from deer stalking. The deer, once so numerous among these solitary wastes, were now reduced to a very few herds, which, sheltering themselves in the most remote and inaccessible recesses, rendered the task of pursuing them equally toilsome and precarious. There were, however, found many youth of the country ardently attached to this sport with all its dangers and fatigues. The sword had been sheathed upon the borders for more than a hundred years, by the peaceful union of the crowns in the reign of James I of Great Britain. Still, the country retained traces of what it had been in former days. The inhabitants, their more peaceful avocations having been repeatedly interrupted by the civil wars of the preceding century, were scarce yet broken into the habits of regular industry. Sheep farming had not been introduced upon any considerable scale and the feeding of black cattle was the chief purpose to which the hills and valleys were applied. Near to the farmer's house, the tenant usually contrived to raise such a crop of oats or barley as afforded meal for his family, and the whole of this slovenly and imperfect mode of cultivation left much time upon his own hands and those of his domestics. This was usually employed by the young men in hunting and fishing, and the spirit of adventure which formerly led to raids and forays in the same districts was still to be discovered in the eagerness with which they pursued those rural sports. The more high-spirited among the youth were, about the time that our narrative begins, expecting rather with hope than apprehension an opportunity of emulating their fathers in their military achievements, the recital of which formed the chief part of their amusement within doors. The passing of the Scottish Act of Security had given the alarm of England, as it seemed to point at a separation of the two British kingdoms after the decease of Queen Anne, the reigning sovereign. Godolphin, then at the head of the English administration, foresaw that there was no other mode of avoiding the probable extremity of a civil war but by carrying through an incorporating union. How that treaty was managed and how little it seemed for some time to promise the beneficial results which have since taken place to such extent may be learned from the history of the period. It is enough for our purpose to say that all Scotland was indignant at the terms on which their legislature had surrendered their national independence. The general resentment led to the strangest leagues and to the wildest plans. The Cameronians were about to take arms for the restoration of the House of Stuart, whom they regarded with justice as their oppressors and the intrigues of the period presented the strange picture of papists, prelatists, and presbyterians cabaling among themselves against the English government, out of a common feeling that their country had been treated with injustice. The fermentation was universal, and as the population of Scotland had been generally trained to arms under the act of security, they were not indifferently prepared for war and waited but the declaration of some of the nobility to break out into open hostility. It was at this period of public confusion that our story now opens. The clue, or wild ravine, into which Hobby Elliot had followed the game, was already far behind him, and he was considerably advanced on his return homeward when the night began to close upon him. This would have been a circumstance of great indifference to the experienced sportsman, who could have walked blindfold over every inch of his native heaths, had it not happened near a spot which, according to the traditions of the country, was in extremely bad fame, as haunted by supernatural appearances. 
To tales of this kind, Hobbie had from his childhood lent an attentive ear, and as no part of the country afforded such a variety of legends, so no man was more deeply read in their fearful lore than Hobbie of the Hugh-foot, for so our gallant was called, to distinguish him from a round dozen of Elliots who bore the same Christian name. It cost him no efforts, therefore, to call to memory the terrific incidents connected with the extensive waste upon which he was now entering. In fact, they presented themselves with a readiness which he felt to be somewhat dismaying. This dreary common was called Mucklestane Moor, from a huge column of unhewn granite which raised its massy head on a knell near the centre of the heath, perhaps to tell of the mighty dead who slept beneath, or to preserve the memory of some bloody skirmish. The real cause of its existence had, however, passed away, and tradition, which is as frequently an inventor of fiction as a preserver of truth, had supplied its place with a supplementary legend of her own, which now came full upon Hobby's memory. The ground about the pillar was strode, or rather encumbered, with many large fragments of stone, of the same consistence with the column, which, from their appearance as they lay scattered on the waste, were popularly called the Grey Geese of Mucklestane Moor. The legend accounted for this name and appearance by the catastrophe of a noted and most formidable witch, who frequented these hills in former days, causing ewes to keb and the kine to cast their calves, and performing all the feats of mischief ascribed to these evil beings. On this moor she used to hold her revels with her sister hags, and rings were still pointed out on which no grass nor heath ever grew, the turf being, as it were, calcined by the scorching hooves of their diabolical partners. Once upon a time this old hag is said to have crossed the moor, driving before her a flock of geese, which she proposed to sell to advantage at a neighbouring fair. For it is well known that the fiend, however liberal in imparting his powers of doing mischief, ungenerously leaves his allies under the necessity of performing the meanest rustic labours for subsistence. The day was far advanced, and her chance of obtaining a good price depended on her being first at the market. But the geese, which had hitherto preceded her in a pretty orderly manner, when they came to this wide common interspersed with marshes and pools of water, scattered in every direction, to plunge into the element in which they delighted. Incensed at the obstinacy with which they defied all her efforts to collect them, and not remembering the precise terms of the contract by which the fiend was bound to obey her commands for a certain space, the sorceress exclaimed, Devil, that neither I nor they ever stir from this spot more. The words were hardly uttered when, by a metamorphosis as sudden as any in Ovid, the hag and her refractory flock were converted into stone. The angel whom she served, being a strict formalist, grasping eagerly at an opportunity of completing the ruin of her body and soul by a literal obedience to her orders. It is said that when she perceived and felt the transformation which was about to take place, she exclaimed to the treacherous fiend, Ah, thou false thief! Lang hast thou promised me a grey gown, and now I am getting ane that will last for ever. The dimensions of the pillar and of the stones were often appealed to as a proof of the superior stature and size of old women and geese in the days of other years, by those praisers of the past, who held the comfortable opinion of the gradual degeneracy of mankind. All particulars of this legend Hobby called to mind as he passed along the moor. He also remembered that since the catastrophe had taken place, the scene of it had been avoided, at least after nightfall, by all human beings, as being the ordinary resort of Kelpies, Spunkies, and other demons, once the companions of the witch's diabolical revels, and now continuing to rendezvous upon the same spot as if still in attendance on their transformed mistress. Well, that's kindly said. We are old neighbours, and we were nae kin. 
and my good dame's fain to see you. She clavers about your father that was killed lang syne. Hush, hush, Hobby. Not a word about that. It's a story better forgotten. I dinna ken. If it had chanced among our folk, we would a keep it in mind money a day till we got some amends for it. But ye ken your own ways best, ye lairds. I have heard say that Ellislaw's friends stick at your sire after the laird himself had mastered his sword. Fie, fie, Hobby. It was a foolish brawl, occasioned by wine and politics. Many swords were drawn. It is impossible to say who struck the blow. Mm, at any rate, old Ellislaw was aiding and abetting. And I am sure, if you were so disposed as to make amends on him, nobody could say it was wrong. For your father's blood is beneath his nails, and besides, there's nobody else left that was concerned to take amends upon. And he's a prelatist and a Jacobite into the bargain. I can tell you the country folk look for something atween ye. Oh, for shame, Hobby, replied the young laird. You that profess religion to stir your friend up to break the law and take vengeance at his own hand. And in such a bogley bit, too, where we know not what beings may be listening to us. Hush, hush, said Hobby, drawing nearer to his companion. I was nae thinking of the like of them. But I can guess a wee bit what keeps your hand up, Mr. Patrick. We are ken it's no lack of courage, but the twa grain of a bonny lass, Miss Isabel Vere, that keeps you say sober. I assure you, Hobby, said his companion rather angrily, I assure you, you are mistaken, and it is extremely wrong of you either to think of or to utter such an idea. I have no idea of permitting freedoms to be carried so far as to connect my name with that of any young lady. Why, there now, there now, retorted Elliot. Did I not say it was nae want a spunk that made you so mim? Well, well. I meant nae offence, but there's just a thing you may notice for a friend. The old laird of Ellislaw has the old riding blood far hetter at his heart than ye ha. Troth, he kens nothing about the newfangled notions of peace and quietness. He's all for the old world doings of lifting and laying on, and he has a wheen stout lads at his back too, and keeps them well up in heart, and is full of mischief as young colts, but he gets the gear to do it none can say. He lives high and far aboon his rents here. However, he pays his way. Say, if there is only outbreak in the country, he's like to break out with the first, and we'll does he mind the old quarrels between ye. I'm surmising he'll be for a touch at the old tower at Earnscliff. Well, Hobby, answered the young gentleman, if he should be so ill-advised, I shall try to make the old tower good against him, as it has been made good by my betters against his betters many a day ago. Very right, very right, that's speaking like a man now, said the stout yeoman. And if so should be that this be so, if you'll just gar your servant draw out the great bell in the tower, there's me and my twa brothers, and little Davy of the Stenhouse will be with you. With all the power we can make in the snapping of a flint. Many thanks, Hobby, answered Earnscliff. But I hope we shall have no war of so unnatural and unchristian a kind in our time. Hoot, sir, hoot, replied Elliot. It would be but a wee bit neighbor war, and heaven and earth would make allowances for it in this uncultivated place. It's just the nature of folk in the land. We canna live quiet like loonin folk. We hanna say muckle to do. It's impossible. Well, Hobby, said the laird, for one who believes so deeply as you do in supernatural appearances, I must own you take heaven in your own hand rather audaciously, considering where we are walking. What needs I care for the Mucklestane more? Any mair than you do yourself, Ernscliff, said Hobby, something offended. To be sure, they do say there's a sort of worry cows and lang nibbit things about the land, 
but when he I care for them, I hae a good conscience and little to answer for, unless it be about a rant among the lasses or a splur at the fair, and that's no muckle to speak of, though I say it myself. I'm as quiet a lad, and as peaceable, and Dick Turnbull's head that you broke, and Willie of Winton, whom you shot at, said his travelling companion. <sighs> Hoot, Arnscliff, you keep a record of all men's misdoings. Dick's head healed again, and we're to fight out the quarrel at Gerrit on the rude day, so that's like a thing settled in the peaceable way. And then I am friends with Willie again, poor child. It was but twa or three heel drops after all. I would let anybody do the like at me for a pint of brandy. But Willie's low bred poor fellow and soon frighted for himself, and for the worry cows, where are we to meet down on this very bit? As is not unlikely, said young Earnscliff, for there stands your old witch, Hobby. I say, continued Elliot, as if indignant at this hint. I say, if the old Caroline herself was to get up out of the groon just before us here, I would think no more. But good preserver, Sandcliffe, what can yon be? End of chapter 2